Welcome to the Reinventing the White Coat podcast, where we delve into conversations aimed at helping you foster a healthy relationship with your career and yourself. If you're a physician feeling unfulfilled or burned out or want to prevent yourself from going down that path, then this podcast is for you. I'm your host, Jennifer Scher, pediatrician, chief wellness officer, and executive and life coach. Sit back and relax as we explore ways to live your best life and have a career in medicine. Today, I'm speaking with Dr. Diane Hess. Diane, thank you so much for coming. Thank you for having me. (laughs) All right. So Diane, Diane is Director of Pediatrics at Concord Medical Group, which is a part of Northwell Health. And she is a both a pediatrician and a board certified in obesity medicine. And I personally know Diane because we were in residency together. Diane, you were one year behind me, right? Yeah, yep. One year behind me. So mm-hmm. it's funny because, you know, we you, you know each other in such an intimate way during residency. But as I was looking through your your bio that you sent me, I had no idea you did an undergraduate degree in public health. Yes. What's I was that? yeah, it was it was a brand new major then. It was the first year it was ever offered. And now it's super popular. Yeah. For undergrad, it was the first year. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've never heard of anybody mm-hmm. who's done that as an undergrad. You were very forward. <laughs> it was I was lucky because I did not enjoy my bio major and I liked my social sciences classes and I knew I wanted to be a doctor when they when they offered it. I jumped at the chance. Yeah. I yeah. Well, well that that brings me to then when mm-hmm. you were social peds at at yes, Monty, yeah, right. Mm-hmm. Which is another thing that was sort of ahead of its time, right? You tell yeah. tell us a little bit of what that is. I remember being like a little confused by that when I was when right. We were so, so social pediatrics is geared towards um, doctors who want to go into primary care for pediatrics who know that they really want to work in the community. So they're they're not people who are looking for a pulmonary fellowship or, you know, cardiology. They're they're people who really want to do primary care. So um, with that public health background, you know, it, it, it also does, we have classes where we learn about epidemiology and statistics in our residency program. We did home visits. Um, we worked in inner city, you know, because we were in Montefiore, we worked in inner city community. So it really just uh, struck a chord with me after having trained at Hopkins and doing public health. Um, so it's really, you know, we joke that it's pediatricians who like to socialize, but, um, <laughs> you know, it is, uh, it's really um, geared towards uh, everybody should have access to medical care and um, for doctors who want to go into primary care. So instead of having call like every fourth night in the hospital, we would work in the emergency room till midnight. And then we were able to have clinic the next day. So we had like four days of clinic where other, uh, you know, uh, the general pediatrics line would do one day of clinic. Yeah, it's funny. Uh, Mm -hmm. When I think of it now, the the me today Mm -hmm. would have loved that. The me back then was thinking, how come these people have less call? And how come, right? It was right, right. And they don't get as much experience on the hemonc floor. How are they ever going to? It's just fascinating. (laughs) Yeah. And I think now when I'm hiring doctors, and I'm sure you have this too, they're, a lot of them work in the White Tower. They don't know how to do primary care. It's really hard to find somebody who's got good primary care training from residency. That is so true. And the mm-hmm. fear of leaving that ivory tower is so, mm-hmm. so real, you know, the safety. Yeah. But mm-hmm. anyway, I want to ask you um, about how you developed your interest in obesity medicine. So, I grew up in a family with three daughters. I was always underweight. I was teased. I was called olive oil. I was like a skeleton. And I ate all the time. I ate thousands and thousands of calories. And then I had two sisters and I'm dark. And both my sisters were light like my mom, blonde hair and blue eyes. And I had one sister, my middle sister, who looked at food and gained weight. And I had one sister who was normal weight. Um, And then growing up, I just watched how my sister, who was tended you know, had a tendency towards being overweight, how her whole life revolved around it, how people commented all the time. How can you be Diane's sister? How can you be blonde hair and blue eyed and so much chubbier than her? We have, we had teachers who wrote in our yearbook, um, somebody wrote, a gym teacher wrote, Diane can fly away during gym class and you're like a lead weight. They wrote that to my sister. A teacher did that? A teacher wrote that in, we have the fourth grade yearbook that says that. And 
And she, and the funny thing is that was in the seventies and eighties. She wouldn't have even been considered overweight really these days. It was just that there was such a discrepancy. Now people are so much, so much more used to seeing kids overweight. Yeah. Well, that's a whole other, we could go down that road. Right. And, and then, and then, you know, to be honest, my mom was terrible about nutrition and she just eliminated all food from the house. And it was so restricted that exactly what the, you know, what we learn now not to do, like, she almost had nothing. We had cucumbers and red peppers and apple snacks. And, you know, we ate out a lot and eating out wasn't junk food, but um, she didn't, my mom just had, a, my mom, you know, has an eating disorder of some sort. I, I wouldn't say she's anorexic or anything, but she definitely has an unhealthy relationship with food. And, and what would happen is I would see my sisters and I would just like seek food elsewhere. Like we would go crazy when we went out to a restaurant or we would go crazy when we went to a friend's house because it was so restricted in our house. Cause my mom was so afraid that her daughter was going to be overweight or her, even my younger sister who wasn't overweight, my mom put that burden on her. Um, so I just, I just saw how my sister suffered, my middle sister mostly. And I just said, when I become a doctor, I want to protect kids from having to go through this um, and find a way that they have a healthy relationship with food, no matter what size they are. You know? And I knew I wasn't, I was a kid, but I knew something was genetic. I knew that I ate more than my sister who was much heavier than I did. I ate much more than she did. And uh, I felt, I just felt so sorry for her that she was always, you know, compared, you know, like that. Sure. You know, it's interesting. I grew up in a, in a household. My mm -hmm. mother was a, a dietitian, registered oh, dietitian, and nobody in our house was overweight, but she had very, mm -hmm. we had, a we had restricted, you know, food choices right. in the house. Mm -hmm. And I have memories of like going to, into the kitchen and like opening the cabinet where like the cookies were and she'd hear it and she'd be like what are you doing <laughs> you know? right right i right. definitely now, would go to people's houses and and sneak mm -hmm. junk and stuff yeah yeah and and then you know it's even to this day my kids are so healthy and they they have such a great relationship with food but my mom to this day as a grandma would still come over and be like i don't understand why you have oreos and i'm like because if you don't because they'll come home and have cantaloupe because that's what they like because the oreos aren't restricted right you know? And, right. and to teach and healthy so eating you were interested in obesity medicine, I would say before it was trendy, it's become like yeah. such a so, huge. So tell me about that. So, you know, in part of social pediatrics is we had to do a project, a research project to graduate. And I, we used to walk past De DeWitt Clinton high school in the Bronx and you would see all the girls sitting on the bleachers while all the boys were running track or playing sports. And I started talking to these girls, most of them were Hispanic, they were in that school building for English as a second language. And because they were in English as a second language, they didn't even have a gym class. Um, and they were mostly overweight, they were eating, you know, Doritos and chips and drinking, you know, quarter waters, which are like these fruit punch that you can get for a quarter. Um, and they had been totally eliminated from exercising because they were just these girls who didn't ad have anybody advocating for them. So I actually started an exercise program. I became a personal trainer during residency and started an exercise program with them, which, but, but we also incorporated health and like learning how to eat healthy and learning what nutrients are, what macronutrients are, what micronutrients are, and really like culturally uh, making a menus for them that like, because they're, they're, you know, as you know, their diets um, are very heavy in rice, you know, so like not having rice with every meal or making choices that you don't have to have a white carb or not frying your food, just like really simple changes. And we made a cookbook and that's where it started. And when I um, finished residency and I got a job, my first job, I didn't really do obesity medicine. They said I could, but then they never gave me time for it. Uh -huh. um, and then you, you know how that goes. Yeah. And then uh, after two years, I was offered a job at Methodist Hospital and I said, you know, I really want to study obesity medicine. Like one day a week, I want to focus on that. And I had a really a forward thinking director who said, you know what, when I was in residency, there were these doctors who said they want to study developmental pediatrics and people thought they were nuts. He's like, who would want to study autism? Who would want to study developmental kids? Mm -hmm. He was a pulmonologist by training. And he's like, and then many years later, it became a fellowship. So he's like, I'm going to let you do this. And I was really, really lucky. And that's how it started. Had. You had yeah. somebody, wait, so did you leave the place that said, no, you yeah. can't do that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. How did you have the guts to do that? Like, I could imagine so many people would just be like, okay, this is the lot that I've been given. Uh, there was many reasons I was working. I think I was on call 365 days a year. That might've been the biggest one, mm -hmm. um, working in a private practice. And I just wanted to get back to more academic 
um, medicine and I really, I really wanted to do OBC medicine. And I feel like with any skill, it's like you use it or lose it. And I felt like I wasn't giving the opportunity to go to the courses that I wanted to take. Yeah. It was before everything's available on Zoom. You know, we had to go that one meeting a year and, and I wasn't able to do it. And I was just reading on my own and I, I needed a group that supported me. And, and um, my chairman really, a Methodist hospital really did that. That's, that's great. Yeah. How did mm-hmm. you, um, what was the difference in how you felt sort of, you know, to, to speaking to people who might be in difficult situations, right? Mm-hmm. How did you know it was the wrong place? And then how did you know it was the right place? So to speak candidly, my boss, my former boss gave every single person who asked for it antibiotics, which was exactly the opposite. It was just right. very old school practice. It was exactly the opposite of what we knew mm-hmm. and, and what we were taught. And then I would see the patients and I was like the young doctor, the new doctor. And the parents would say like, oh, but we're going to Florida. Can we have amoxicillin? And I would say like, if something happens in Florida, you have to see a doctor. Oh, but this doctor always gives us amoxicillin anytime we call. And it was just, I, it was just, I was like a broken record every day trying to explain to parents that like it's yeah. causing drug resistance and you don't use amoxicillin for cold. And there was like many, you know, many things. And it's just, it was very generational. You know, I wasn't the owner of the practice. And I think that in, especially when, in those days, like you wanted to keep this high volume practice and you wanted to keep people coming and he, w- he would have done whatever he, those patients wanted to make them happy. And I just, I was like, this is everything we didn't, you know, we were taught against a Montefiore and I just couldn't take it anymore. And I left. <laughs> yeah. You, you actually mm-hmm. prevented mm-hmm. yourself from going down to, you know, a yeah, it just, sounds like mm-hmm. good for you. So then mm-hmm. now you have like a leadership Right. position mm-hmm. what's you know a lot of people would would say that having a leadership role adds stress to their day and other people would feel like it's um sort of inspiring and and fun or whatever how does how does that land with you so i have to say there was like i was at methodist hospital for almost 12 years which was great um but i had two young kids and i really wanted to work in new york city so i i left methodist hospital and i was still doing obesity clinic there part time and i opened a private practice in new york city and I did that for another 10 years. Um, and there you learn how to be a leader because I was the only person in charge. So you start, you open an office and you have zero patients. So you have to hire staff and you have yeah. to hire a nurse and you have to hire a front desk person and you have to choose which EMR you want to buy. And none of this we learned in residency. Right. So, so you have to learn it and, and you sit there and you total your thumbs and you're like, well, I know friends of my kids, friends who might want to come, you know, and then you go to school fairs and you go to health fairs and you walk to nursery schools and you knock on doors and you give people your card and you tell them what you have to offer. And that's, that's how I did it. So I did that for 10 years. And I have to say, I am not a good office manager. And that is why I'm back working for a hospital. I'm not a great judge of character. I, I, it's well, hard to find probably good staff. like everybody, right? Yeah. And I always give people the benefit of the doubt. And sometimes I'm too trusting. So I learned the hard way. I made a lot of mistakes along the way. And I think that this job, um, you know, being in charge of outpatient pediatrics is where I'm really comfortable, but I have enough leadership skills of running two offices and during COVID three offices um, under my belt. And that like I I learned and you learn from your mistakes and I learn about inventory and how many vaccines we need to stock and how many, you know, how many people we need at a front desk and how many phone lines, like things that you don't think of when you're just an employee. So right. I think it's a, it's a good mix. Do you enjoy that piece of it? I do. I do. I like, I mean, I don't love making PowerPoint slides. Don't get me wrong, but, um, but I do love having a say in how the office is, is run. And I think that as having, and I know you work in private practice, having been in private practice for so many years, you know, the, the pulse of the community mm-hmm. and you know what parents are looking for when they're choosing a practice. And I wanted to be able to give, the patients downtown in New York City, that same feeling of coming to a private practice, even if it's owned by a hospital. Right. And you've met, you're managing to do that, which is... Yeah, there's there's always like little bumps in the road, you know. Mm-hmm. But but yes, I, I think for me, I sleep yeah. better at night knowing that somebody else is hiring and firing people. <laughs> I think yeah. that was the hardest thing for me. Someone else does that, but you get to make some of the local decisions and how you want to run your day to day, which. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or I, I want to choose which brand of vaccine we buy or when we start giving the flu shot or are we having Saturday hours or not? Because I've, I've gone through this. I know what works. 
Yeah. yeah, that's great. Good for you. Mm -hmm. So tell me, how are you balancing both the general peds and the, are you overwhelmed? Are you um, doing, it's like you're constantly so, almost reinventing yourself and, right, uh, as you go right. through your journey, right? So, so um, truth be had, I don't do obesity medicine all the time because it's very time consuming and it's very emotional. Mm -hmm. It's almost like psychiatry. Yeah. But you don't get reimbursed like cash psychi psychiatrists. Mm -hmm. um, so you spend a lot of time with the patients. Sometimes, you know, the first visit, 45 minutes to one hour, because you're, you're not treating the patient, you're treating the family in, in any kind of nutritional, right. you know, problem. And, um, you know, just to get the history is one visit, you know, just to get how did you become so overweight? How did this child become so overweight by six years old or by five years old or by two years old? Mm -hmm. And, and, um, and you have to make a connection with the family that you're not judging them. So they want to come back. Right. Because most families I see, I'm the last stop in the road. Like they've been to endo, they've been to cardiology, uh, they've been to their pediatrician several times, and the parents feel judged. And if they feel, and especially if the child feels like a failure, they never want to come back. So um, it's about finding that little connection that you can make with them. Like, oh, your family likes to jump rope, or oh, you, you, you go to the mall, let's park the furthest from the mall instead of the closest to the mall. Or, oh, you have stairs in your building, let's try to take two flights of stairs instead of taking the elevator the whole time. You just the little things. If you give them little goals, especially for the kids who have often failed at a lot of things they've tried, especially in sports, if you give them something that they can accomplish and they come back two weeks later or three weeks later and they said, you know what, I was able to, I didn't do the stairs every day, but we did two flights of stairs five days a week. And then you say that, great job. Instead of the last doctor that they went to and said, you still drank soda, you still drink soda, you're going to be obese, you know, right. and being yelled at. So it's like a, it's like a dance that we have yeah. to do. And you have to engage the entire family, you know, then they go to grandma's house, right? Mm -hmm. And it's totally right. different. Right. And, and yeah. who's making the food and who's doing the food shopping. And, you know, and a lot, you know, like, like you said, your mother was a nutritionist. My mom definitely had something with some, some bad relationship with food. Mm -hmm. A lot of these mothers have some of the mothers have very unhealthy relationships yeah. with food. Um, also put, teaching all the societal mm -hmm. stuff into it. I mean, <laughs> there's it's, you just, it's just from experience and like learning, you know, like, you know, every, everybody comes in. It's very different. When I worked in the inner city, you had one population um, in New York city, we get a huge diverse population, but some kids are in public school where the, the public lunch is terrible. Mm -hmm. And then we have other kids who go to private schools and they're so wealthy. And then they come in and they say, Dr. Hess, I ate a buttered roll, I ate spaghetti and the pasta, you know, and I ate the pasta bar and then I ate a baked potato. And that's like their whole lunch. Yeah. Um, or family style meals where they, they get to take as much as they want and they're six years old. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just, that's why I don't do it every day, to be honest. It's just very yeah. time consuming and it's, it's very emotional. It's like you get involved with the families and you want them to succeed. Um, I have to say that this, the whole, um, the, the whole use of medications now yeah. has really changed the game, but also changed expectations mm. because I was probably one of the first doctors in the country to use GLP-1 agonists, like to mm -hmm. use Ozempic or, or Wagovi or Sexenda with children. And that was for many reasons why I stayed in private practice because mm -hmm. I was on faculty at a big teaching hospital as a voluntary and they wanted me to come on to do obesity clinic, but they said, if I come on as an obesity medicine doctor, I can't use the drugs because they weren't FDA approved yet. Mm. And I said, but then you're making me work with my hands tied behind my back because I know what I'm doing and I don't use drugs on every child. And that's, that's a big thing now because um, every single person who calls for an obesity clinic appointment wants a drug. Well, just like those moms wanted the amoxicillin for their, right? For their right, right. <laughs> and, you know, that's my last resort. And that's what I try to teach families. And that's where yeah. I disagree with the AAP a little bit. Yeah. With, so I feel like the American Academy of Pediatrics had ridiculous um, recommendations 18 years ago saying every pediatrician should be able to treat obesity because none of us had time to treat obesity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then they went from that to every single kid who's over 12 should be offered meds or surgery. Like yeah. there's got to be a place that we meet in the middle. Isn't that always right? Moderation mm -hmm. and... It's always the answer to everything. And, and then to explain to families, and I don't know if you've gone through this yet, but 
just because something is FDA approved doesn't mean your insurance covers it. Oh, yes. And then these drugs are thousands of dollars. Mm -hmm. And most of the children who come to see me don't meet the requirements to get it because they're not diabetic yet. And for most, they have to be for their insurance plan to cover it, you have to be a diabetic. And yeah. we're lucky that they're not diabetic yet. But um, and then we have and I always explain, I'm actually going to type a handout now to explain to parents that just because it's FDA approved doesn't mean your insurance is going to cover it because the expectation is that they're leaving with an injectable drug that's going right. to cure their kid. Yeah. And everybody wants a pill, right? Mm -hmm. How are you using ge um, the genetic tests in your evaluation these so, days? So um, if, if they meet the criteria and their BMI is 97th percentile or higher, they can get free genetic testing from Prevention Genetics. Have you, have you used it yet? I, Fatima has, I have not. Okay. Yeah. I told her yeah. that. Yep. So, um, so if they're, you know, if they want now, some people don't want to do genetic testing because they're afraid if something's wrong, it'll go into their child's chart. Um, and I explained to them that this is totally separate from their medical chart. This is a study that's being done by rhythm pharmaceuticals and it can only help your child because if you find out you have a gene, you might be eligible for a new drug that's coming down the pike. And I have, I actually have a family that's three family members. So if one child tests positive for any gene, even heterozygous, the whole family can get tested. So we have one family where the child, the proban, the child who's obese is eligible for the new drug. So he's starting a trial at Columbia mm -hmm. and he was tested three years ago. So, you know, that's amazing uh, that they keep you yeah. and they call you. They don't forget about you. Right. And then it turns out that his mother and his brother are not overweight. But they both have genes for obesity, and they're not obese. So they mm -hmm. want to study them as well. And not the same gene. It's so yeah. crazy. Genetics is nuts, you know? Um, uh, yeah, I think medicine is going to I mean, we're on the cusp of some serious changes yeah. all around. Based I, I feel like I don't know anything about genetics, I can just do the test, and then I pass them off because it has yeah. changed so much. But, um, you know, I did have another I had a patient this week who has a genetic, she's heterozygous for the MC3R receptor, um, you know, that gene. And she did great on Ozempic. And now her insurance stopped paying for it. So I just had to write an appeal. And then I asked the parents, is it okay if I send her genetic test to the insurance company? Because people are afraid that you get labeled with something, maybe your insurance is going to drop you. They're not supposed to, but this is right. a fear that we have in this country, sure. right? That you have a pre-existing diagnosis. Sure. Um, yeah, so it's a lot. And I don't have a nutritionist. And I don't have an exercise physiologist. I do it all by myself. Yeesh. So, so well, how so, are you not um, burned out? <laughs> Cause I don't do it every day. <laughs> I do it. Yeah. Like I, I do it. I see, I would say like 60, 40 general peds or 70, 30 general peds obesity medicine. You're protecting yourself a little but It's not like there's mm -hmm. not a million people probably lining up the door who want to at the door who want to see you. Right. How do you manage the saying no? <laughs> Actually, I, I, it, it used to be like that when I worked in Brooklyn, definitely uh -huh. was. And then um, the demand isn't as great in Manhattan. I think Manhattan does like where I am downtown, there is just less overweight and obese children, geographically speaking. I think when people find out about me, yes, then then like, you know, one doctor, two doctor, many psychiatrists, yeah. I actually get a lot of referrals from psychiatrists, mm -hmm. um, because the medications make the kids so overweight. Um, but I'm not like busting at the seams. But I okay. but um. That, that being said, now that I work for Northwell, they want me to come to see kids in Westchester. There's a one-year wait in Westchester Ooh. to be seen. Wow. I don't know. I yeah. always think, too, you know, about the – There's it's such a complex issue. And um, the fact just like I, I'll, I remember, I can't – many, many years ago, that this obese – teenage Jara who I was doing a checkup on and when I did the private you know when I had the mom leave the room I said to him is it a, is it okay if we talk about your weight you know I didn't want to shame him or anything but so I asked for kind of permission mm -hmm. and he started to cry because he had gone up from the last year he had been mm -hmm. like a normal BMI and now mm -hmm. he was and he started to cry and he said something along the lines of you know when mom and dad dad left and then we have all we're doing is eating at mcdonald's and you know like like the social piece just changed so dramatically for this poor kid that you know it wasn't mm -hmm. about talking about the food it was more talking about right. then right yeah i once had i once had a little girl tell me it was so funny she said my 
my grandma is visiting and she's a Trumpster and a Trump or a Trumpster, whatever you say. And it's causing so much anxiety in our family. And I just keep on eating. It was very, very funny that she said that to me. But there are, yes. And that's, that's the psychological component. And also, then you have to, I have to remember, I'm not a psychologist. So I'm, I have to be a good listener. Right. You know, but I don't always know how to fix things. I know how to fix their cholesterol. I know how right. to fix their glucose, but I don't right. know how to fix the family all the time. It's and hard. Not, there's just right. no way, right? And, right. Um, yeah. Have, you know, we're really pediatricians now are really expected not only to manage weight, but to manage mental health. Mm-hmm. And that's a huge whole other topic. Yeah. And but. yeah. And finding somebody for mental health and weight, because mm-hmm. you can find people who treat anorexia, but it's interesting. There's not a lot of people who are comfortable treating obesity yeah. in the mental health world. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thank you. So Diane, I'm going to let you go mm-hmm. soon, but tell me, you mm-hmm. really seem to have navigated your career in mm-hmm. in such a healthy mental space, um, staying on on an emotional path, even though, and, mm-hmm. and I know you've had some personal issues along mm-hmm. the way. Um, what advice would you give to people who are just starting out or younger on, on kind of how to... Um, maintain their joy of medicine and staying connected? Well, I think it's really important that you could always change. You know, it's even if you sign a contract and it's two or three years, there's always an option out. If you're really unhappy and you feel like you're being abused or it's not the right fit, change because you won't be a good doctor if you're really unhappy. Mm -hmm. That being said, you know, when we, when we graduated and I had to, I had to start paying my, my loans, I took one of, you know, a job that I was offered, but I, I wasn't thrilled doing it, but I learned so much. Like I, I was seeing 40 patients a day. Now who wants to do that? Nobody, but I learned more than I, I think that I did in residency in some ways. Right. And also um, asking questions when you're like, when you're negotiating your contract, like what is my call schedule? And, and, um, do we get bonuses or do, you know, because I think also as doctors, we were not taught, taught anything, especially in pediatrics about money. Yeah, right. And we have to pay our bills right. and, you know, like, and, you know, do I get an increase? Do we get an increase with inflation? Does my, does my paycheck stay the same? Do I get paid biweekly? Um, is there incentive if I work harder? Do we get our salaries based on RVUs? I didn't know. I still, I'm not really sure what an RVU is and I'm, you know, <laughs> <Right>. 51. <laughs> Yeah, learning um, how to but, negotiate is, yeah, sure. I would say that's a huge thing to know if you want to work in a rural population versus a suburban versus an urban. You know, there's always things you can learn in different populations. It's just really, you know, and, and to advocate for yourself. You know, when I was really unhappy at my first job, I knew if I stayed there one more day, I would like leave medicine. Um, and just, you know, network. When you go to conferences, take people's cards, meet people. I mean, it's so much easier now because they have yeah. social media and, they can just, you know, residents who are graduating and doctors, young doctors can easily access other physicians. For us, we really had to go out and introduce ourselves. I know. <laughs> right? Challenging. Okay. One more question, Diane. You know, people who uh, might be interested in obesity medicine and want to reach out to you, but also um, exactly uh, something about the fellowship training, if you could tell us about that and then how they can sure. So now, now th- times have changed and some hospitals actually have obesity medicine fellowships. Most of them are for adult medicine, but some hospitals do have pediatric obesity, whether it be through their endo department or their um, gastro in- gastroenterology department. And some have their own obesity medicine fellowships. They're usually one to two years, depending on the hospital. Um, but the way I did it was I took an exam that exam is no longer given. That organization was called the ABBM, the American Board of Bariatric Medicine, became the ABOM, the American Board of Obesity Medicine. So we actually write the exam. And I was, in a, uh, I was an exam question writer for eight years. And we write the exam in Philadelphia, just like all the other subspecialties. Like it's, it's a lockdown test center where we write the questions and there's a bank of questions. Um, and doctors of all, all types of doctors, OBs, gynecologists, um, psychiatrists, radiologists, some people want to reinvent themselves. Some people just want to go into yeah. obesity medicine on the side. They can sit for this exam. Um, there's courses that you can take. There's books that you can read. Um, the conferences are great. 
And, um, you know, pediatrics is growing and there's many more doctors sitting for this exam and we do well. Pediatricians yeah. do really well on the exam. They're nervous because they don't know adult medicine, but they do really well. Yeah. And it is a nice way to sort of uh, reinvent yourself and have a little bit of a, you know, specialty practice if you're getting, you know, bored exactly. of, the, of, the, of the usual things. So, Diane, thank you so, so much for joining us. It was really great to see you today. Thank you for having me. Reunited after so many years. Yes. We'll hopefully see you soon. All right. Take care. Bye. That's all for this episode of Reinventing the White Coat. If you enjoyed this conversation, subscribe now so you don't miss an episode. If you're interested in coaching or in being a guest on the podcast, you can reach out to me online at sharecoaching.com. Thanks for listening. And don't be afraid to live your best life.